All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's program, The Role of Insect Eating in Human Diets, Past and Present. This is part of our ongoing hot topic, Human Origins Today topic series. My name is Brianna Pobiner, and I'm a paleoanthropologist and educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Whether this is your first time joining us or you've attended our hot topic programs before, we're so glad to have you here. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. This discussion offers closed captioning. You can turn them on or off via the CC button, which should be located at the bottom of the Zoom interface. As you have questions during the program, please go ahead and submit them to the Q&A box, which is at the top or bottom of your screen, depending what kind of device you're on. So we can sort through as many of those as possible. The Q&A really flies by. The Q&A box is also where we'll share any relevant links during the program, so keep an eye out there. We'll start our program with an opening presentation by our speaker, Dr. Julie Lesnick, and then I'll join her here to take your questions. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Dr. Julie Lesnick is Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. She received a PhD in anthropology and an MS in kinesiology from the University of Michigan in um, 2011. Her primary interest is in evolution of the human diet, specifically in regards to entomophagy or entomophagy, <laughs> eating insects. She undertakes research in South and East Africa, reconstructing the role of insects in the hominin diet. And her research has been funded by the Leakey Foundation, as well as other organizations. She is a, also a 2015 to 2016 recipient of the American Fellowship from the American Association of University Women and a 2018 to 19 fellow of the Leshner Leadership Institute for Public Engagement with Science of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Her 2018 book, Edible Insects and Human Evolution, reconstructs what insect consumption likely looked like across human evolution and highlights the importance of incorporating edible insects into our world's current and future food needs through an evolutionary perspective. So welcome, Julie, if you wanna turn on your camera and microphone. Um, she's joining us today to talk more about this topic and how insects play a huge role in our food security and sustainability. So thanks, Julie. And um, while you're giving your introductory presentation, I'm going to turn off my camera and microphone and be behind the scenes, and then I will come back on at the end to facilitate the Q&A. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that great introduction. Uh, I look forward um, to our conversation at the end of my presentation. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about the role of insects in the human diet from um, our earliest ancestors to today and looking forward into the future. And so to give you kind of an outline of that, um, I'm going to start with the future um, and, and how people here in the United States are kind of talking about insects as food. But then um, what you'll see is that, you know, people are talking about it is like the future of food, the answer to so many of our problems. And then me as a paleoanthropologist who studies this finds it kind of funny because it's clearly a very important food of the past present and future. It should just be considered human food. It shouldn't need all of these qualifiers. Um, but part of the reason why we need all these qualifiers is that we have this great sense of disgust widespread here in sort of, you know, uh, what I put in quotes, a Western world. Um, and so Western being Europe and all of the, you know, uh, colonial um, kind of history of Europe and the, and the areas that today still maintain sort of constant contact with that culture and have become kind of collectively known as this amorphous idea of Western. And so, but we, it, it's something you kind of know when you see it. And one way you can know it when you see it is that people don't like the idea of eating bugs. Um, and so to get started, this idea of the future of food, these are um, uh, grabs from one of the largest cricket farms here in North America. So they are in Toronto. Um, so they're in Canada, they're Entomo farms. Um, but they are producing crickets on a large scale for human consumption. And so this is relatively new here in the United States. We've had cricket farms producing insects for um, pet food trade. So if you go into a pet store, you might be used to seeing crickets. So the infrastructure was already there. And then all we had to do, you know, sort of in the cricket industry is update everything to make sure it fits human, you know, food grade standards. 
Um, and so, the, uh, so these farms are popping up. There are farms all over the place. And so you can see here that the advertisement for this is very much about the food of the future and really looking at um, insects as a sustainable food choice. And so what you can see is when you compare insects to traditionally raised livestock, they require so much less resources to produce the, the nutrients that we then intake as food. And so everything pretty much scales, right? So cows are really large and inefficient um, and produce a lot of greenhouse gases. As you scale it down, pigs are a little better. They use a little less land, a little less water, produce less greenhouses. And you scale down to chickens. Chickens are actually quite efficient. Um, and then, but even insects then are then even more efficient than yet compared to chickens. Um, and so basically it's a very simple scale. And when we get down to the small scale of crickets, you're essentially getting out what you put in. You put in food to them, they convert it into almost equal amount of food for us. And so they tend to look like they're gonna solve all of these problems. And they really are a superfood from almost every angle you look at them, from their nutritional um, uh, quantities, the nutrients that are in them to these wonderfully more sustainable farming practices. But like I said, this is, you know, the, the idea of farming them at this scale is new and is the future of food, but the insects themselves themselves are nothing new. And so when we look about, you know, we think about human evolution, um, I just want to use this diagram throughout my, uh, throughout my talk. So I just kind of wanted to show you how I, I take this, uh, what we call the March of Progress, which is this poor representation of evolution. It looks like there's a direction, like evolution's always been leading to us all along. Um, but evolution doesn't quite work that way. Instead, evolution, you're fitting into your specific environments. And our current form currently works. Um, but there are many forms that currently worked in the past that with environmental changes, no longer work. Um, and so that's sort of why I have this correction. It gives us this idea of time to it as well. And so the, the furthest down here um, on this diagram is who I refer to as the Australopithecines. They are some of our earliest hominin ancestors living around four to two and a half million years ago. Um, and there's a lot of different genera associated with them. So kind of collectively, we can call them. Um, they're not all Australopithecus. Um, so collectively, I like to refer to them as Australopithecines. So these Australopithecines, in a lot of ways, are um, very ape-like. Their brain size is very chimpanzee-like. Their body size is very chimpanzee-like. Uh, and so when we're kind of trying to figure out what they were doing in the past, looking at chimps and our other ape relatives helps us try to figure out what life for these Australopithecines were like. They were walking on two legs, they're upright, so they definitely are our ancestors and share that with us. But when it comes to what they're eating, what they're thinking, what they're doing, they're probably much more like chimpanzees than they are like us today. And so when, actually go back to that, when we think about these um, hominins, for I would say for the last 50 years or so, if you asked a paleoanthropologist, did these Australopithecines eat insects? They'd, pro they'd say, yeah, sure, probably, because we know our ape cousins do, we know people around the world do, um, so it makes sense. But it's really hard as a paleoanthropologist to reconstruct parts of the past that we don't have direct evidence for. And so although paleoanthropologists would answer that question positively and say, yeah, they were probably eating these insects, we didn't really talk about it in the literature. But then in 2001, these bone tools from a site in Swartkrans, South Africa, these bone tools, um, we have almost a hundred of them from across a few different sites. They, I, I compare them to like the size of a Sharpie marker if you're gonna hold it in your hand. The, we know they're tools because one end, you can see it across the top here, is worn and polished and kind of made into a point from use. Um, and then the back end is just broken off. So like the other half of this, we would never identify as a tool unless it was also used to dig. So basically sort of the, you know, well, the processes that could have sort of accidentally lead to this um, are unlikely because there's so many of them. So there's not gonna be 100 bone fragments sticking in a river and getting river worn. So the best explanation is that it was produced by tool users, by the hominins that were at this site. And so Lucinda Backwell in 2001 uh, did experimental research to try to understand these preserved wear patterns on the ends of these tools, the, the 
the marks, the scratches, the, um, the dings, every little mark on these tools. And she did a bunch of her own experiments with tools she made from, you know, bone that was available to her. And she compared the wear patterns. She did different tasks like digging into the ground for tubers, stripping bark off trees, but then she also dug into termite mounds. And what she found was the best match in the pattern was what was in, were, were the tools that dug into the termite mound. And most of this is because of these sort of striations being parallel and really narrow. We don't have a lot of scarring. We don't have a lot of um, big rock percussion marks. Um, and so if you think about an Australopithecine digging in this way, it's a pretty unilateral direction. And so you get this sort of all the striations going in the one direction. They're also all very narrow and uniform because the termite mounds are finely sorted soils. They had to be carried by those tiny termites. So they're not carrying boulders when they're making their termite mound. So this was a huge find. And so in 2001, or not even a huge um, research discovery, because we'd known these tools since the 70s. And so this is one of those great stories of like pulling artifacts out of a drawer and kind of rediscovering knowledge about them. And so in 2001, we started talking about insects differently and thinking about how these tools were used and why she even tested it in the first place is because chimpanzees use tools to forage for termites. And so when we think about chimpanzee tool usability, one thing they do is they have the ability to use a tool set, to see tasks as like a first and then second thing, to use one tool and then follow it up specifically with a second one. And so these bone tools that the hominins were using might've been part of a toolkit because just turning a mound into dirt isn't really useful. So they might be just doing things slightly more complexly than chimpanzees. And so I have a video here of, um, of a chimpanzee using a tool set to forage for termites. And another really important thing about these termites is that there's so many of them available in the mound. They're eat, they're eat. If you can access them, there's so much nutrition available. Um, and the mounds are pretty easy to spot when they're large on the landscape. So they're a very useful, um, pretty reliable resource. And so what we see here, um, this is a video from the Republic of Congo, and she approaches with one tool in her hand, and she's going to perforate open an exit hole um, that, of the termite mound. She has a second tool in her mouth. So if you watch closely, she's now going to grab that second tool. She threads it into the mound, and then the termites attack that tool like it's a breach, right? It, it's, a, it's an attacker. And so these termites have um, pinchers that go, pretty much work in one direction. They bite and don't let go because their job is to protect the mound. It's the soldier cast. So chimpanzees take that to their advantage. They, they use these mandibular pinchers of the soldier termites and use that against them to pull them out of the mound. And so when we think about this, there's a few things going on here just in this one video. It's one, it's chimp females are really the adept tool users. Um, males tend to be more worried about their place in the social hierarchy, and females tend to worry a little bit more about getting the right nutrients that they need to survive and reproduce. And so then they also provide opportunity for their children to learn. And then the female uh, offspring tend to stick around longer and get really adept at this task. And so this is a photo I took, and you can see that if you look closely, she is nursing her young daughter here. And then after her daughter was done nursing, the mom left this spot on the mound and the daughter took over that active termite hole. So it, it, it's not directive teaching, but it is opportunity for her to explore and kind of do what her mom was doing. And eventually she learns to fashion the tool, learns to use it. And so one thing, another thing about these, these chimps and what they're doing with these termites is that there are a lot of different termites available um, in their habitats, and they're very strongly selective of the ones of the genus Macrotermes. They have those mandibular pinchers as their defense mechanism, as opposed to like a toxin spitting defense mechanism, so they can use it to fish for them. But they're also larger termites compared to others, and they're really high in protein and rich in fat. So in thinking about what the hominins were doing, these are a very nutritionally useful resource. So maybe these are a good termite to think about in these reconstructions. And they're what I do. Theoretically, when I've reconstructed these models, I've used macrotermies um, and the nutrition they offer to reconstruct the hominin portion of the diet. And this is because macrotermies are essentially unchanged for 20 million years. They evolved over 20 million years ago during the Miocene period, which is the same time our ape ancestors were evolving. And so we know that they were available on the hominin landscape, and we know that they were as nutritionally um, uh, dense as they are today 
because really they're no different genetically. And so I, recon I use them in my reconstructions, um, but again, it's just been all in theory. Until a few years ago at the site of Olduvai um, in, in Tanzania, one of the most famous fossil hominin sites about uh, with layers about 1.7 million years ago that are our hominin activity layers. We have their bones, we have their tools, and we now have their bones and tools right next to a preserved termite mound. So this is my ongoing research. Um, I was sent a photo of this feature and, and I've been working with a geochemist colleague and we've been doing every sort of chemical assessment we can of this soil to confirm that it is indeed not only macrotermies, but also ancient macrotermies, that this isn't a recent inclusion because termites are colonizing and, and take over landscapes. Um, and so we've done every sort of test and it is amazing that we can actually demonstrate without a doubt in our minds that this is definitely an ancient termite mound that the hominins were hanging out by. So I still cannot prove to you that they literally put those termites in their mouth and digested them for nutrients. Can't do that at this point without a time machine, but we have almost every sort of evidence, um, tangential and directional evidence pointing to this saying that if these hominins are as smart as we give them credit for, they should be taken advantage of this resource. So that was my big um, you know, research project over the last couple of years. And we're gonna be working on writing this up um, soon. So that's Australopithecines, right? They're going after termites, they're going after the social insects, just like we see chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas do. But when we kind of go up this, you know, you know, getting closer to us in time, we look at the, our genus, when we're looking at Homo erectus, um, what we're seeing with Homo erectus is that morphologically, behaviorally, they're starting to resemble us a lot more. So to try to understand their behavior, um, chimpanzees probably no longer provide the best model. What we're seeing with Homo erectus is that brain size in Homo erectus jumps up greatly compared to what we saw in earlier human evolution. So this is one of those biggest brain size expansions. And so um, we're starting to see Homo erectus brain size be on the cusp of modern human brain size. So we know they're smart. We can look at their tools and we can tell that they are using complex forethought in order to make those tools. Earliest tools are, are very simple. You kind of hit two stones together. You have to get the angle just right, but it's really just one hit you're going for. Um, with the these hand axes that are, are very common for Homo erectus, you have to have the idea of what a hand axe looks like in your brain and, and then do all the right steps in order to make it. So we know Homo erectus is, is um, more intelligent and their behavior is well beyond that of what we see in chimpanzees. And so if we're trying to reconstruct what they're doing in the past and what their insect portion of the diet looks like, we should be looking at modern foragers. And so it's important for me to say that when we use modern foragers in these um, uh, models of past uh, human behavior or the behavior of our ancestors who are not fully modern human yet, um, it's really important for me to note that these modern foragers are modern humans. They have the same intelligence as us, the same physiology as us, the same bodies as us. They are fully modern human. The thing that makes them different is that they live within their environment. Right? They live in environments that are useful to us for understanding the past. If you look at what I'm doing, I'm in a house with air conditioning. I sleep on a magic bed that adjusts to my body weight throughout the night. Like my behavior is not useful for understanding what was going on 2 million years ago. But somebody who has to find a way to use natural elements provided from the forest to provide shelter for themselves and to find food and to get enough energy and nutrients to be able to survive and reproduce, their behaviors are much more aligned to what we could expect our, our ancestors were doing who are living in similar environments. So in this idea of using modern foragers as a model, we know that there are correlates of foraging no matter what environment these foragers are in. So they could be in the tropics, they could be in the Arctic, they could be cold, they could be hot, they could be wet, they could be dry. Like, doesn't matter. We have these correlates of foraging. And what we see is that when a group of humans is living within their natural environment, group size must stay small or else you're going to outstrip all your resources. You have to be mobile because you will outstrip your resources in local areas and need to continue moving in order to keep everyone fed. 
Um, when you're living this way, you're not really storing resources like you are if you're farming, right? You don't have granaries to store your resources. And so when you're constantly moving, you can't store resources like that, which means you can't store power. And so we see egalitarian um, uh, societies here. We might have respect for elders, um, but in general, everybody's equal. But within that equality, we do see what's called sexual division of labor. Men and women in these societies do some things differently especially when it comes to procuring food. And so here's just a quote from um, a 2000 paper that was studying some foragers in Sub-Saharan Africa. It says that it would appear that the consideration of gender cannot be excluded from a discussion on entomophagy in terms of what is consumed and who is involved in the gathering and processing of insects. So we know that if you look close enough at insect eating in these foraging groups, you have a little bit of, of sexual division of labor showing up. And so three examples from three different continents. So in Southern Africa, the Kung San, what we see is that when the women are out in their normal foraging um, patterns every day, if they come across a really productive termite mound, they will stop and sit there with their friends and eat all day. And then they'll take some back to then help prepare for a group meal. But there's something social about this too. It, not, it isn't just a nutritional resource for this group. It is important and it is a way that these women connect with each other when they're foraging for these insects. Um, in South America, the Aceh, what we see is that insects are so important that the women in their foraging trips spend a dedicated 15 minutes a day to their collection. Um, so to me, that means that they are important enough to carve time out for. And then again, if they come across these insects, usually beetle larvae um, is what they're going after. When they come across these uh, beetle larvae anytime in their foraging routine, they will collect them when found. So again, showing that value. But, um, so they eat a variety of insects, but again, mostly beetle larvae. The Aranda is a um, uh, indigenous group of Australia. And this quote from a, a, a monograph in the 1950s, I really like because it highlights kind of why women are, are maybe going after insects more than their male counterparts. And what we see here is that women accompanied by their children carry digging sticks and go out in search of small fauna, including social insects that are available year round. So we're seeing termites, caterpillars, and ants being consumed um, by this population. But what we're seeing is that it's a low risk activity. You can bring your kids, they're not gonna get hurt. Um, and you're going to likely go home successful having found the insects you are looking for. And so when we're thinking about this division of labor and why women are eating insects more than men, the reliability that um, reduced risk of failure for acquisition when going out for insects is a big part of it. But when we look at it nutritionally, women and men have different nutritional needs, especially when women are reproductive, when they are pregnant or lactating. We think of men as needing more protein than women because they have more muscle mass um, but than women on average. However, when women are pregnant or lactating, their protein needs go up beyond that of a man's. And so they actually need more protein. And so instead of relying on risky, you know, uh, hunting of animals that you might go out and not succeed, or if you don't go out because you're worried about the your well-being or your kids' well-being and you're waiting for somebody else to bring back meat, that's even a worse strategy. But to be able to go out and procure your own protein from insects seems like a really great strategy. And we can see that when we look at the insects that I was just talking about, all of these nutrients that increase for women when they're reproductive, folic acid, calcium, protein, general energy like lipids, um, they, they are all available in insects. And especially if you eat multiple, the more variable your diet in general, the more uh, assortment of nutrients you'll be able to get. And same thing, the more varied your insect diet is, the more of these nutrients you'll be able to get. Just to note, these um, dashes are not that that resource isn't available. It's that this is still a very young field and we don't have all the knowledge. Not every insect has been researched in terms of its nutritional um, contributions. But what we can see is that in general, insects provide these nutrients that women need. And so it's likely why they consistently across the continents and all of these foraging groups go after insects more than their male counterparts. And interestingly, it matches what we see in our primate cousins as well. So we see it in chimps, but I could actually, if I had more time, I could show you other examples of monkeys and apes that show a similar um, disproportion in insect parts of the diet across male and female. 
So we're thinking about the Homo erectus diet. When we look at Homo erectus fossils, if we look at their teeth, if we look at the chemicals in their bones, um, we can tell that their diet individually as individuals is more variable than what our Australopithecine ancestors were doing. And so again, more variation in your diet, you're getting more nutrients. You have, it's sort of the blanket approach. If you try, if you eat everything, you're gonna get all the nutrients you need because it was in something. Um, and so that's probably more what the Homo erectus diet looks like. And so if we think about the insect portion as well, we're moving beyond the social insects and adding more of that caterpillar and beetle larva um, insect portion to their diet, most likely. So when I'm reconstructing Homo erectus, looking at the modern foragers, I look, I think they're eating insects more variable than just the social insects. Moving um, closer to us here, I just want to stop at the Neanderthals for a minute because they are really important when we're talking about this, why we don't eat insects. When we're talking about that Western diet, that's really a European diet, um, Neanderthals are the ancestors in Europe. They're, so their diet is ancestral to the European diet. And so, um, so when I think about what they were doing, Neanderthals were living in glaciated Europe. It was cold, harsh environments. They had to eat meat um, because they can't eat the dead grass. So they have to eat the animal that can eat the dead grass in order to extract nutrients you know, from the environment. So they likely ate very few insects because one, it's redundant to the animal meat that there's expert at, experts at, at obtaining, but two, they're not available year round, maybe seasonally, maybe at the Southern end of their range, but it would not be a reliable resource in Neanderthal habitats like it is in Homo erectus or Australopithecine habitats. So when we're thinking about the, the Neanderthal diet or the Western diet or the European diet, insects were, do not have a deep history in this diet um, because of this glaciation history where Europe's been covered in ice for so long. And so we can look at this map of number of insect species consumed per country. And you can see on this map that it's largely a tropical resource. China's a kind of a, a outlier here, it kind of screws up the visual um, of this map, but actually within China, it's the southern provinces where we see most of the insect eating, so falling um, in the subtropics. And so it, this is the insect eating around the world. It maps beautifully with latitude on a gradient. The further away you get from the equator, the less likely you are to eat insects. And so that's what we're seeing in the European history is this environmental uh, history playing through on why insects were never a major part of it. But that doesn't explain why insects are considered disgusting, right? Not having something a part of your diet shouldn't automatically mean that you have this strong negative opinion to it immediately when you think about it. So that's a little bit more complicated. And what this comes down to is, you know, anthropology 101, ethnocentrism. We tend to judge others by our own standards. And so if we don't eat bugs, when we see somebody else eating bugs, we tend to think that that must be wrong because I would never do anything that was wrong. I've made decisions for myself and it's an informed decision and what I do must be right. And so somebody doing something different must be wrong. That tends to be how we tend to look at others and other cultures. So we tend to think of it's different if it's wrong. But what we see then is if we look through um, sort of the colonial history of Europeans who do not have insects in their diets, in their environment, traveling across latitudes in a way that had never be done, been done before. So Columbus coming to the Caribbean and encountering indigenous populations, consuming insects, it was a surprise. Um, but also these explorers had ulterior motives here, right? They wanted that land. They wanted these people to be slaves in their sugar plantation. And so it becomes a, a sort of propaganda to talk about these people as more animal-like. Because if you can show that these humans are more animal-like, you can start treating them like animals with less worry on your conscience. And so the letters home from these explorers were very uh, clear to explain that this insect consumption was, was very animal-like. And so we see from Diego Alvarez Chanca from uh, Columbus's second voyage, 
writing that they eat all the snakes and lizards and spiders and worms they find upon the ground. So that to my fancy, their bestiality is greater than that of any beast upon the face of the earth. So this is racism playbook play one is to make people look more animal-like and then you can start degrading them. And, and what we see here, we know the history of Columbus's voyages and the genocide and such that follows. But even then we can go, 350 years later with John C. Fremont, um, who is a U.S. Senator and participant in the California genocide. So the California genocide is the murder of thousands of indigenous um, peoples during the California gold rush when, when, um, when everybody was moving to California to try to strike it rich finding gold you needed more space for more white people. And so genocide of the indigenous populations there was done by the US government. And here in this quote, roots, seeds, and grass, every vegetable that affords any nourishment and every living thing, insect or worm, they eat, nearly approaching to the lower animal creation. Their sole employment is to find food and they are constantly occupied in a struggle to support existence. And so these narratives are a part of our history. And so when we're thinking about our attitudes, towards edible insects, it's really important to remember where our food culture comes from and how big of a part this is. And so here I'm saying that our reaction to insects is cultural, right? But you might be sitting there going, my stomach is churning, churning and I kind of want to gag when you, when you mention eating insects. Um, and so how can that be cultural? Well, Disgust is one of the few learned emotions. We learn it really young and it gets programmed deep in our brains. And so it becomes automatic and physiological. So if you think about it, a kid, a two-year-old will put anything in their mouth. You have to stop them from playing in the garbage or in a toilet by giving them a big disgust reaction. Oh no, that's disgusting you. Don't put that in your mouth, right? And that trains the pathway in the brain to avoid that because it can be harm harmful. There's pathogens in garbage or in the toilet. But we can transfer that and make disgust reactions to things that are not harmful. And so eating insects is not harmful. They are very good for us. People for millions of years have been eating them. And so when we give our disgust reaction, we are taking away a nutritional resource from somebody who might need it. And so I really like this phrase of just don't yuck my yum, um, because it's really hard to overcome this. We are part of our culture and this has been ingrained in our neural pathways. But if we can start acknowledging that just because we don't wanna eat them doesn't mean they're harmful and that we probably shouldn't take that away from people who do wanna eat them, we can just politely say, no, thank you. We don't need to have these big performative disgust reactions because you don't know what kids are around. It's really hard with TV and media always portraying insects as this, this fearful thing is this disgusting thing because our kids are always um, seeing that. And so my hope is when I think about the future of insects, I really think of it as a generational turnover. We have been programmed this way for so long, but if we, if we start making the effort and start raising our kids with the idea that insects can be good. If a kid wants to put a bug in their mouth that they found in the garden, don't say, ew, gross, say, Oh, put that one down. Let's get you bugs that are safe to eat, right? Like the, we have ways of approaching these topics now. We have the knowledge and we really can make the change. And so if we're really thinking about a sustainable future, insects really are a superfood. They really check all of the boxes of what we need to solve so many problems. And so we got to start talking about them differently. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I have a list of resources for you. One, I have my book and I have a link for that. That'll be in the chat. Entomo Farms is at Large Farm. Um, I really like them and I buy from them a lot. Jiminy is in Iowa and is a small startup and I just love her and love what she's doing. So I buy a lot of my crickets from her as well. And then I gave you a link to my favorite cookie recipe that uses cricket powder. Um, and it has a lot of strong flavors. It has clove and cinnamon and coffee. And so all of those flavors are beautifully aromatic and strong flavored that the cricket, you can taste it, but it acts with them instead of against them. So like, instead of trying to make a chocolate chip cookie and adding cricket powder to it, where you get just a bad chocolate chip cookie, um, this really incorporates the crickets into something uh, that I eat way too many of um, and often make myself too sick from eating the whole batch myself. Um, so I wanted to provide you those links um, and I am happy to take your questions. 
Wow, fantastic. That was such a wide ranging presentation, Julie. Thank you. Um, I will, thank you, great. Mm -hmm. So we have some questions already, so I will dive right in. Um, so a question from Akash, and I'll paraphrase. And I think you started to touch on this at the end, but how can we bring awareness among people um, that like consuming, about consuming bugs as food? I think that, you know, one of my, I've been amazed at how well it's worked when I've mentioned insects as food and people have had that strong disgust reaction. Um, I pointed out to them and I was like, what, what, like that reaction, what you just did is visible two rooms over. Um, and, and so these big reactions are, are, are probably more than like, if you think about it, do they really need that big of a reaction? Has eating a bug ever hurt you? Have, do you know anybody who's eaten a bug who was hurt by it? Like why? And so I, I pick at people's big disgust reaction. And I've, I've been surprised at how open-minded people have been to going, oh, I never thought about that, right? Because we do, we just, I think, especially as women, we get attention if we're like, ew, like it's just part of our culture. Um, and so we use these ways of communicating that just fall into the patterns of, of what's expected of us instead of thinking about it. And so I've started challenging people to think about their reaction. And then if they're engaged, then I talk about things like colonial history. Um, and I've been really amazed at how well people have taken to that. Nice, thank you. Um, so here's a question, maybe at the other end of the spectrum, but from Danella, are there some insects that are harmful to eat, just like we can eat some mushrooms, but some are deadly? Yes, 100%. Um, and that's why this for, uh, forager knowledge is so important too. Um, and and, and in, in, in truth, when, when I'm thinking about like our consumption of insects, I'm always giving you links to farms. Um, wild foraging of insects is something that if you're already, if you already forage for mushrooms, if you already forage for wild greens that you use in your salads, if you're already a forager, then learning which insects to forage is a very similar, um, you know, educational curve of learning which ones are harmful. And, and they have signals like bright colors usually means something's not good about them. They're either poisonous or toxic in some sort. Um, lots of barbs on their legs, like you don't want those in your throat. So there are some tricks like for like, so now you know those two things. So if you're stuck in the woods, like those are kind of basics. Um, but yeah, but you got, it's the learning curve, just like mushrooms. And you can learn which ones are harmful and which ones to avoid. But if we all start go foraging, foraging for insects, um, Right now, we are on the cusp of what people are calling an insect apocalypse, because as climate changes, insects are so tiny and so well adapted to their tiny, tiny environments. And so the smallest changes affect them. And so we see lots of insect species dying off right now. Um, and so if we add all of a sudden, every American's going to start wild foraging, we're going to do a lot of harm to our biodiversity. So I think foragers should be able to continue foraging. But for us who don't forage, the farmed insects um, are held to the standards of, you know, USDA, you know, regulations, you know, they're safe. Um, there is some worries about allergens. Um, people will tend to put a, a broad statement of if you're allergic to shellfish, you may be allergic to insects. Truthfully, the link is, is, um, it isn't very strongly, like I haven't seen a really good correlation of that in the literature, but it's so scary. It's such a severe reaction. So that all the cricket farmers just want to be super safe. Um, but for the most part, we tend to eat some bugs all the time accidentally. Um, and I think it keeps our bodies primed and we don't see as many allergies to insects as we do almost every other food right now um, in the United States. So I think there is a positive pathway um, for insects for us in terms of allergens that way. Nice. Um, so I'm going to follow up with two questions from different people that are kind of follow-ons from what you were talking about. Um, Lily, Levy, Anna Maria, and George all together asked, how many insect species are edible? Do you have any estimate of something like that? We, so some amazing human um, went through all of the literature and tried calculating our current now. And so this is our, our academic knowledge of insect species. So this is not actually fully exploring the traditional knowledge of all of the foragers and the knowledge we've lost from the marginalization of these people. But we know from these records of studying what, what has been observed by researchers, over 2,000 species that are consumed around the world. And so that, and 
that is, like I said, the small little slice that we can actually provide evidence on. Um, but truthfully, there are so many insect species, we can't count them, that there will always be nutritionally useful insect species available to us. And that is one of their kind of powers as a superfood. Nice. I think you may have sort of answered this already, um, but Stephen asks, we eat crustaceans. Why are land-based <laughs> bugs any different? Yes. Um, my husband really likes shrimp and every time he's eating it, I'm like, Ooh, sea crickets. Um, just trying to kind of like change that narrative. And it is, it's just cultural. And a lot of like, um, I, do, I should probably learn this. Well, I should learn this history better, but at the same time, it's kind of folk knowledge at this time. Um, but lobster being what was fed to prisoners so much that the prisoners complained that they got fed so much lobster um, to then becoming a elite food. And so we see these foods make these huge transitions. Um, and so we're kind of hoping crickets will make that same journey like lobster, like sushi. Um, so it's funny to me because of all like we tend to like plastic package and not see the animal in our food and so that is part of it when you say insects um it's the whole insect unless it's powder and you see the eyes you see the legs so that's why you know it it easily triggers people but then people do love lobster and crawdads and 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 shrimp that they have to de whatever devein and pull the shell off and you see their eyes um but that's okay because they've done it since they were a kid or and so it, it's just that um what you're used to here's a great um two-word question from madeline why crickets why crickets that is a great question um one because of the infrastructure that we already have so we've been feeding crickets to um lizards and other pets for a long time part of that is that we eat them in their adult form um, so a lot of the things I've, I was mentioning people eat are beetle larvae, caterpillars, mealworms are beetle larvae. Um, and so you have to catch them in their correct life stage, which makes the harvesting more complicated because you have to catch them the right moment. So eating in the adult form is one thing that makes it really easy. Um, and two, um, their habits, like I like to say it, like if you think of where you find crickets, you find them in dark cramped spaces, like you lift a rock and there's some crickets. Um, and so they do well in the boxes that we cover them in and, and farm them in. So they don't need like termites have incredible, their termites are incredibly amazing from like every angle. Um, they're architects, they, they, they keep a um, well-ventilated mound that's the constant temperature and how they do this is phenomenal and amazing. Um, but we can't reproduce that very easily. Like it's very hard for us to create the habitat of a termite mound and raise termites for eating. So there are a couple of different things um, in terms of their sort of life cycle. But then the other thing I would say is that we just tolerate crickets a little more. Jiminy cricket was cute. They're lucky in some cultures. They chirp, they sing, um, they don't sting, they don't bite. So we just have more positive associations with them, which allows them to kind of, we can kind of build on that to get people more familiar with them. Awesome. Thank you. Um, here's a good question that follows up on this question from May. Can we raise our own insects to eat? Yes, 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 yes. So this is exactly how I think we could actually solve some of the global problem. Because as much as I love what the large farms are trying to do and what they're do, trying to do is going to be better than traditionally raised livestock, eventually they're going to be these giant central cricket farms that require great distribution and all of the um, uh, energy resources that it needs to take a truck full of crickets across the country. When the greatest uh, avenue towards actual sustainability and helping people like who have a hard time affording what to eat. You can have small cricket farms or mealworm farms. Those two um, both exist and you can take control of your own protein needs, sort of like chickens, but even easier. Um, and so it's, it's not that hard to learn. Um, there are programs around the world trying to get these sort of at home cricket farms in the hands of people that are um, in food and stable, unstable areas. Um, and, and so it's really it's that cultural disgust about them, again, that that's stopping this from spreading. But there is so much potential at urban gardens or at your own home or co ops or to do it really locally and solve so many problems. Again, they really check all the boxes. Awesome. So 
I guess, sort of a personal question. Um, there are two questions that I'll combine. The first is from Rob. Did you try any annual cicadas this summer and what was your favorite dish? And the second question is from Mindy. Are there any cookbooks out there that you would recommend? Um, I did not try the cicadas. Um, they were not in my area in Michigan, so I was going to have to travel. Um, but I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't eat a lot of bugs. Like I eat crickets, um, but like I was a picky eater growing up. And so every new bug that I try requires like a stealing of myself and a, oh, you get paid to do this sort of like uh, approach to it. it. And and so that's why I'm really like what I do because I know who I'm talking. Like I, I'm, if I can convince myself that these are the answer, then I know how to convince other people. And cicadas are, again, are big. Um, I do much better with smaller bugs. So I can do handfuls of crickets and mealworms. Um, I actually really like uh, uh, June bugs were really crunchy um, and enjoyable. Um, it, but the bigger they get, the wearier I get. Um, so I wasn't like rushing out of my house to go try the cicadas. So that is me being very honest with you. Um, cookbooks. I believe there is a book called Bugs for Beginners. Um, it was in uh, production. So I believe it's out now. Um, if you search it, at least they should have a website. That is a great starting place. Um, and so I, there are other cookbooks. Um, there's an eat a bug cookbook, which has been around well before this current movement. Um, but that chef really likes celebrating the whole insect, right? So it's like skewers with grasshoppers on it. Um, and so that's not, again, that's not bugs for beginners. That is so you tend to work up to the eat a bug cookbook. Nice. So here are some questions more about your sort of um, career. So Akash asked, how did you get interested in um, entomophagy and paleoanthropology? What did you study to get into the field? And Ben asks, how did you get interested in this line of research? And what are the big remaining questions for your research? Um, I entered grad school with a personal statement wanting to study brain evolution. Um, and, and so that I was very interested in the time period that I ended up studying this like 2 million years ago where brain size was like incrementally increasing. Cause one thing we know in evolution is that whatever happens, what happened right before it is really important. So, so we have to build on what came before. And so the large brain expansion that explodes with Homo erectus and, and with modern humans is, is, is piggybacking off the little expansion that happened in Australopithecines. And so that's what I wanted to study. Um, and so then two things kind of shifted me in the direction was one, um, in studying brain expansion, you have to study diet, right? You, you, you can't expand these brains without the diet to support it. So food and brain size evolution became very intertwined in, in my mind. Um, and so then I started studying food a little bit more um, in my interest with brain evolution. But the other thing is that I'm just an animal person. Um, I used to train horses. I have dogs and cats. And so animal behavior is something that's always been important to me to kind of understand. Um, and I had never really taken primatology until I got to grad school. Um, and so it was once I was at Michigan and John Matani was there who, who uh, studies chimpanzees um, and I started taking his classes. I started realizing that I understood chimpanzees really well. I understood animal behavior um, and I could incorporate it into my models of human evolution. And so then it was very obvious like, well then tool use in brains is clearly goes together and chimps are smart because they use tools. And then I started just recognizing that people didn't talk about the actual termites. Like they talk about chimps using tools and how smart chimps are for using tools and teaching their kids to use tools. But we never talk about what they actually, oh, for termites, right? Like we don't really focus on, on that part of the diet and all of the avenues that we can think about going into the past. And so I just realized it was this gaping hole. Um, and then those bone tools happened to get published right around the same time. There was a lot of interest in insects as, in, in what their chemical makeup was and could we see it in the fossil bones. Um, so I was just in grad school at a time where insects were a little bit more interesting than other times, but I also just kind of had all the right skills to kind of get into this. Awesome, thank you. Speaking of tools, here's an interesting question and, and related to food um, from Rowan and Sersha. So um, they're wondering if, an, if ancient humans use tools to clean their teeth after eating. That's a great, we have evidence of that for Neanderthals. Um, we actually have scratch marks on teeth that don't match up with 
anything other than using a, a stick to pick. Um, I don't think we have anything older. Brianna, do you know anything? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember it in Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is cool. We definitely have it. Oh, somebody asked me uh, questions that I still have. Well, one thing that I'm waiting for is that we're starting, we have the technology to study like the DNA of all of the components that make up dental plaque. Um, and so we are going to start finding bugs in teeth in hominins. Part of the problem is that we used to clean this off the teeth. So the fossils in the museums are all beautifully clean teeth. And we erase this amazing information rich resource because we didn't know where technology would go in the future. And so finding the teeth that preserve that dental calculus or, or the plaque, um, we're now having to start sort of at, at square one and hope to find all new fossils that we can really test on this. Um, but the thing is, is that the people researching this, my goal in my career is to get people who research this stuff to ask to to, to ask the questions related to insects because we've been ignoring it. And so by me being out here and loud enough, um, people will start asking these questions when they do come across that dental calculus, as opposed to it being one of those things that has to be dug out of a drawer 30 years later when somebody wants to ask it in the future. So I do believe that in my career, we will find some really cool um, insect remains in dental calculus. Awesome. So I think that's a good, at least one answer to this next question. Um, We'll stick in the past for a moment and then I'll switch back to the present. Mm -hmm. So Rob asks, given that recent work on isotopic and toothwear signals of diet have challenged some assumptions about what certain signals might mean, what do you see as some promising new routes for reconstructing hominin diets? Oh my goodness. Okay. So, (laughs) um, so I, I'm, oh, come on. This is not, <laughs> As, aside from, you know, being able to maybe find traces of insects yeah. uh, in dental calculus. Yes, exactly. So for me, so there are, there's sort of the like experimental work we can do to understand those things more. Um, so that's sort of one of the, the points I was making is that we tend to do these analyses and look at a bunch of things as possibilities that don't include insects. One yeah. of them that drives me crazy is grit on teeth. People go, oh, their teeth are worn. It's They must've been consuming grit. There must've been dirt on the meat they were eating. <laughs> I was like, it's much easier to get grit from a termite mound, right? So, so it's that sort of like gap in logic in sort of our field that we need to narrow. Um, so to me, grit, if I, to me, that screams insects if I, when I see grit um, as an explanation, but most people aren't me. And so then they, they come up with more convoluted explanations for it that don't hold up to testing as well. Um, but these are sort of those just so stories that we can't really test. And that is the hardest thing about insects in the diet. Um, we do have the ability to start finding molecular evidence of insects. So that's how we found that that feature was a macrotermes mound is that 100% we know that macrotermes were there. Um, And so that sort of um, chemical research can start being applied to just soils in general, like understanding the insect fauna that was available at a site and just reconstructing these insect parts of the environment just like we do with, we are able to do it with animal bones, right? And then by doing it with the animal bones, we know what's available and we can reconstruct the environment. So if we can start doing that, if there's interest to start doing that with insects, we can start understanding micro environments a little more. Um, And that's gonna give us more narrow idea of what the foods available were, including the insects. So it really just, it comes down to, all of the indirect ways we can find insects because we're never going to find a bug on a plate um, or in a stomach, right? We're just not, it's too old. We find that for more recent remains, mummified remains, um, but for the ancient stuff, it's just so hard. So we just got to keep getting smarter with how we kind of sleuth them out. Yeah, so I think I think you've answered this question. So Stephen asks, has termite DNA been found on Australopithecus teeth? Yeah, not that I know of. Um, mm-hmm. And again, it's it's mostly because we don't have it. Um, the Sediba finds in South Africa came out after we knew about kind of dental calculus. So we have Sediba 
dental calculus. Um, so it's an australopithecine in South Africa. Um, and they didn't find insects, but I also haven't harassed them enough to ask if they looked. Um, so maybe I need to do that. Um, I think they might have, because I think I think they came to me and said, oh, no insects. And I was like, oh, darn. But I don't, I didn't ask them enough. Um, so yeah, it really is. It's just getting people to think about it and to look. Nice. Um, so, well, I'll turn back to the present for the last couple of questions. So Walter said, I didn't know there was so much sexual dimorphism in the foraging and eating of insects in present day equatorial people. What do the men do while, when the women are foraging? Oh, geez. Um, so the, the nice answer is that they are out hunting. The honest answer is they're often not doing much. Um, and, and, and I kind of, and, and sadly so, because honestly, what you see in a lot of, of places is if they have access to alcohol, you'll see men that are, are spending their days drinking while the women are foraging. Um, and, and so we, as sort of modern society has intertwined with these populations, they aren't as pristine as we like to pretend when we're talking about them and making these reconstructions. So that's sort of the historical answer is that men are, are, are going after the riskier resources. So we tend to think of them as hunting large animals, um, but we also, uh, it can be mushrooms, right? Mushrooms grow on the sides of cliffs and places that are, are, are riskier to get to. So they'll go after the riskier mushroom instead of the more easily available mushroom. Um, so that's what we tend to see men going after the riskier resources. But as sort of modern um, globalized society infiltrates into these communities, um, the hunting and stuff becomes harder because you don't have the range of land to use. You're using, um, uh, you might be hunting some, but you're not spending your whole day going after them. Um, and so we tend to see, see, we do see patterns of alcoholism in men in a lot of these foraging populations. All right, thanks. I think this may be the last question we'll see, or maybe we'll get one more in after this. Um, I know we have many that we weren't able to answer. This question is from Megan who says, I live in California where I work with indigenous folks and I've been taught about cricket or grasshopper drives. These drives have been coupled with cool, good prescribed burns. Um, I wonder if you could speak to this practice. Yes, so um, awesome that you know about this, great question. Um, and the prescribed burns are so important, so so relevant right now in, um, in the US West. So prescribed burns, what, they'll, what a prescribed burn does is that you intentionally burn an area, um, paying attention to the wind, knowing that the wind is then gonna take this fire maybe to a river or something that's gonna stop it, um, uh, the Great Salt Lake or something like that, a, a lake or some sort of um, feature that'll stop the burn. And so you, you line up in a way, you work with the winds. It's very intelligent and understanding of natural um, uh, environment. And in the prescribed burn, what it does is it then burns up all the undergrowth that in the event of sort of a lightning struck that strike that's, or, you know, what we see now with cigarettes or whatever, um, that stuff goes up so fast and travels so fast. So by doing these prescribed burns, you're keeping that undergrowth at a manageable level so that in the event of some sort of natural fire, you don't lose so much land so quickly. So in doing that though, another thing, if you do it at the right time, when the grasshoppers are there and you're burning the grass of the grasshoppers, you're not only just clearing that underbrush, you are driving all of the grasshoppers to that exact same place that you want the fire to stop. And so now you can send people to the other end to collect those grasshoppers. Um, and so usually what, the, I think it's usually something like digging troughs um, and so then they'll kind of go down in the trough and the fire will go by and then you can kind of cover the trough um, and collect the grasshoppers. And that is, the, the indigenous knowledge is amazing. So the prescribed burn, so relevant. But one of the narratives of why we don't eat insects is um, people associate it with agriculture. They're like, oh, well, once we started farming, uh, insects became a pest and then we hated insects. And so now we try to kill them and, and it adds to our anti-insect mentality. But when you look at small scale farmers across the continents, if people that are farming in their backyard for their own nourishment, or maybe they're selling crops, bringing it to market or something, the easiest, most natural pest control is to go pick the grasshoppers or other pests off 
the plants, you're not using any chemicals, and then eating those grasshoppers. So not only did you stop the pest from hurting your food crops, you also just got a protein rich animal based food um, that, that you can now utilize in your diet. So we see that across the continents. And so this incredibly intelligent land management using the consumption of insects as part of the way to, to maintain the land is, is, is really our history. And so everything we do now is opposite of that. And what we're realizing is that maybe we need to start making food choices that are more in harmony with the land. And so insects are a great example of that. That seems like a perfect place to end for today. So thank you. I apologize to everybody whose questions we didn't get a chance to get to, um, but this concludes today's virtual program. So please join me in thanking Julie for sharing her work with us. I'd also like to give special thanks to those who made this program possible. This includes our behind the scenes team who helps sort through your questions, our donors, volunteers, and viewers like you. And finally, to all our partners who help us reach, educate, and empower millions of people around the world today and every day. We thank you. So I hope you'll join us for our next program coming up on September 30th, um, where the director of the Smithsonian's Human Origins Program, Dr. Rick Potts, will talk about um, doing field work or virtual field work in the time of COVID. Um, so we've put a link in the Q&A where you can find information about our upcoming programs and how to sign up for the museum's weekly e-newsletter. If that's really the best way to stay informed on upcoming programs and learn more about the museum's research and exhibitions. After this webinar ends in just a moment, you'll see a survey pop up asking for some feedback about the program. Please take a moment to respond. We're really curious to know what topics you might be interested in seeing for future programs, and we appreciate your input. Again, thank you to our participants. Thank you to Dr. Lesnick, and um, thanks to the audience. We'll see you next month. Take care. Thank you.